pleasure to be moderator with these stars to my right. But before I say anything, you're going to get a pop quiz. What's this? Doom, doom, pop, doom, 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 pop, doom, doom, pop, doom, doom, doom. Students, what is that? That's the central beat of hip hop. And if you don't know, you need this lecture. <laughs> with these three guys. We're going to do it alphabetically. We'll start with John or Herb. And John, I have one question for you. Yes, what sir. is the role of innocence in the art of Keith Haring? Innocence. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I like to think that the uh, innocence means something uh, very important related to uh, preserving one's nature. Um, and it, it, it means uh, being careful about the things that you absorb and the things that you hold uh, private to yourself. And um, so, uh, you know, we have the barking dog and the uh, crawling baby, and certainly they represent some kind of innocence. And, uh, and I think that, uh, I think Keith wanted to cut through some of the, the complexity of uh, intellectual dialogue about uh, contemporary art and, and to, uh, deal directly with the people. And uh, so the use of iconic images that were far more innocent was very useful for that. And uh, so I think uh, Keith Heron used uh, the comics and uh, those and also a very simple uh, figuration that was very clear to everyone. Um, but there's a whole other aspect of innocence that we're talking about too, uh, which is, uh, you know, we had talked about transgression and innocence versus you know, purity and purity. Uh, maybe I'll leave it at that. We'll go further into this. Well, conversely, the, you know, yes. transgression is a rhyme, the other rhyme. you want to talk about that? Uh, well, I really... They go together, transgression yeah, and... Yes, they do go together, and, and uh, I think Keith Haring uh, had a kind of uh, a joyful, youthful celebration of a, a kind of uh, adolescent gay liberation. And... Uh, and I, I think he wanted to be very clear with people where he stood in terms of his sexual attraction. And, and this was very clear, and he, he was very uh, expressive about that. So uh, are we talking, are we calling gay transgressive? I don't know, but I mean, there's a lot of sexual references in his work. Well, well, you know, I want, another thing I know you love to talk about, scale. Mm. Yes. Keith, scale is everything. Well, I was, I like to talk about Keith's uh, athleticism with scale, with the way that he was able to uh, address a wall that was possibly 50 feet long and and freely uh, work, work over a wall without any hesitation or consideration of the problems inherent in doing this. And, uh, I, I, I think that one comparison of scale is the, uh, the graffiti artists that were doing top to bottom whole subway cars at the time, which was an amazing sense of scale that was happening uh, just previous to the work that Keith Heron was doing. So he was seeing the street artists, the graffiti artists, uh, taking on a very free sense of scale as they worked outdoors on walls. Would you yeah. say that his mastery of scale, one of the reasons why he's able to jump from street to gallery, just like that, because of the abstract expressionists who are always showing off scale, so he's going to show it off too. Well, his, his first show at Tony Schifrazi uh, I think it really premiered his uh, tarp paintings uh, primarily as artworks for sale. And I have this sort of uh, a notion in my own mind that the secret of the tarp paintings is the drip technique that he used. And I think when he would, he would do this amazing line going very fast, but the drip would sort of like maintain 
this sense of momentum and speed is expressive in the line or doubled. Uh, so it always maintained this sort of action painting look yeah. to it. And it looked like it was very spontaneous. And if you if you cross off all the drips, it loses some kind of energy. So the drips are very important. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you had mentioned something about innocence? About, yes. Uh, about yeah. about uh, innocence. One of the things that always strikes me, the way Herring uses it, I mean, even, even simple uh, line drawings like this in the subway, which he was famous for, is there's always this sense of the fragility of innocence. You know, it, it's not a naive kind of innocence. You know, it's a sense that uh, we, we maintain it and protect it at great cost because there's always all, the, these, all these other menaces, you know, around that can rob you of it, you know, and, and destroy it. Yes. So, so there's, this, there's this sense of, of needing to, to, to maintain it and, and, and somehow hold it and preserve it amidst all of the other shit that's going on in the world, you know, and that's a very hard thing to do. Well, I, I want to kind of expand on the idea of innocence to the idea of liberation. Um, I think one of the things that's really important to understand about Keith's journey and, and the essence of his work is having come from small town America to New York to essentially reinvent himself. Um, you know, we talk about innocence it, it, it's sort of as a as a unencumbered blank slate. I think that was sort of the initial joy for Keith coming to New York and being able to sort of uh, reevaluate who he wanted to be, how he wanted to approach the art world, but not, uh, not in a really sort of necessarily academic, programmatic sense. I mean, Keith brought an academic sensibility and, and a greater understanding of the art world proper to the street level world and, and activity he was involved in, but I think you know, in, in a much different world in 79, 80. Um, it was a much more innocent time, and I think that that period and that sense of discovery informed his work that way. Yes. You know, and, and mm -hmm. even, even in, in sort of physical terms, what you describe about how Keith proceeded through a wall, proceeded through a space, um, uh, nobody more embodies the, the, that sense of liberation, that sense of starting in the beginning and, and discovering where you end up along the way, as opposed to uh, you know, really having a restrictive way of working. I don't think you said that all of me, that, that Keith accomplished his stylistic universe between 1981 and 82. You want to amplify on that? The whole show is about that, but I'd love to get your take on it. Um, well, a. <laughs> I'm sorry. Where do you begin? Yes. Uh, it's a lot happened in 1981 for him, and uh, apparently. Uh, I think that um, his drawings, his chalk drawings, must have been a really important moment for him to realize that that he could he could take a piece of white chalk and draw on these uh, these black pieces of paper in the subway, and uh, and that also that he had a, a very simple um, a variety of, of images to work on. You know, one of the most interesting pieces to me in, in this show is the early pure abstract line work. Yeah. With, you know, you can see how he developed the iconography and what his intention was in terms of both, you know, politics, sexuality, and, and, yeah. and innocence. But at the same time, that, that one real gestural piece really uh, encapsulates the energy, the motion, the movement, the, the rhythm that he, yeah. that he uh, applied as his iconography developed. He tried everything out, but then through that process of experimentation and improvisation, he got his vocabulary and it gave him, 
you know, like a set of jazz or hip hop sequences. You know, you could vary it, you could improvise, you could take any space and make that an improvisational moment. And once he had that basic vocabulary down, he just ran with it. He could do it anywhere, any scale, right? Any mm -hmm. place, on canvas, on a wall, in the subway. Um, it was just something he intuitively got, you know, how he could improvise in that. I was going to say that when he, when he was doing the sort of uh, non-figurative overall pieces uh, that gave him his speed, his sense of delivery. He was already doing it before he knew what he was going to draw. And uh, the style was almost there, completed. And all he needed to do was a little sharper focus as to what the subject matter was. Um, so in a way, his style preceded the subject, I think. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, there was a real fearlessness in Keith from day one, both in terms of the content he challenged as well as the physicality of um, sort of a, a absolute self-confidence in line. That's what's always amazing is that self-confidence. You see him, in fact, the video in the, uh, in the exhibition, if you haven't seen it yet, of the painting, painting myself into the corner, uh, he just starts out in this space. He doesn't know where he's going. And this is a very early work. Was that 78 or 79? I, I think 79. 79, SBA, yeah. you know? And uh, he maps out the space and he fills it in and, and he knows that the line is going to take him there. His line is going to find the way, you know? And he just does it intuitively. No plans, no drawings, no sketches. He's got this space and he's going to fill it in. It's, it's really brilliant. John, is there anything we haven't touched that you want to talk about? I wanted, I wanted to point out that, um, like Keith, Keith Haring, I was once a young man. And um, so I remember being a young man. I remember how life uh, evolved and changed from one week to the next. And that the sense of the world that you were living in, especially the idea of what it meant to make art, was changing from month to month, and it was evolving and changing. And, and it's kind of amazing as an older person to look back and think that that was the way it seemed at that time. And I was going to mention how New York City from the mid-70s to the beginning of the 80s, how, how New York City evolved and, and how the idea of what it meant to make art evolved during that time. And it, I think it, it, it involved a lot. And what I remembered, uh, I, I like to say that I was an innocent person. And I mean that in a self-deprecating kind of way, like uh, a lack of sophistication or knowledge about things. And um, so I remember that you know I, I came to New York, and uh, there was the uh, dematerialization of space. There was a kind of a, uh, a very radical sense of the extremities of art in both in performance and, and the, uh, using the extremities of materials. And, and I think, in my opinion, what the artist did at that moment in time and the, towards the, the end of the 70s is they pulled back from that precipice and they got much more conservative. And they started thinking, please bear with me when I say yeah. conservative. What I'm saying is they decided that they had a responsibility to address people and not just do whatever the fuck they were thinking about doing as, as an extreme act yeah. was not the point. The point was more communication with people. And so the, the, yeah. the art changed. The artists uh, started thinking in a more, I call it a more conservative way, like for instance, some of the filmmakers started thinking, I'm going to try to make narrative movies, you see? Yeah. That's very conservative, as opposed to, and we were stepping back away from abstraction, towards subject matter, towards having something to say to other people, and the, the reception that we got, especially among regular people, started becoming very important to us, you know? And I say us, and I think Keith Haring is sharing that, you know? And some of this preceded him, and then he led the way as a torchbearer from that time. And you know, uh, one of the responsibilities of an artist is to make sure that his work will last beyond him. And of course, with you, who is 
taking plaster and substituting it with fiberglass, but we're left. Is there, is there anything about his painting where you could feel that he was using a medium that he knew would last, or that he was thinking of the future as well as the painting? Well, he, he became much more conscious of materials after the first couple of years. If you look at even some of the pieces in this show, they were um, done with magic marker. They were, they were in some ways very unstable. And I think it, it was very early on in 81, 82 that re Keith realized that, you know, he'd always been conscious of longevity and making his mark, but I think yeah. he uh, addressed the materials on a whole different but level. But real longevity exists in our hearts and yeah. in our minds, not in the materials. You have Kwong Chi taking photographs of drawings that made, he made in the subway that would not last more than two weeks at the most. Those pieces will forever be some of the most important, iconic images that he created. And the context is everything. The fact that they themselves did not last does not matter. There is longevity in the documentation that Quan yeah, yeah. Chi did of his work. I think there's different categories of art making, too, that he was very, very much aware of. The, the subway drawings were just a great spontaneous serendipitous act you know and and those pieces are really they're really acts you know they're they're, they're performative you know they're ephemeral they're for the moment uh, he wasn't thinking long term about what they were going to uh, what was going to happen to the material and you're absolutely right but the the record of them as an act you know the audacity of that act you know and the performance is is what lasts and then he started reconceiving the way you know he could do other kinds of work uh, he was doing work on all different kinds of media. So. Well, yeah. well, yeah. well yeah. I, that's all it. Yeah. But these yeah. were documentary photographers Absolutely. making sure that whatever that was we had a cultural record of was it. going yeah. to last in in documentary uh, in photographic documentation. I think. It's but but I think he was also conscious of operating on all these levels at the same time. I mean, I think that's one of Keith's greatest gifts, is not to sort of be. Uh, tunnel vision in terms of what was fine art, what was uh, public art, what was product, and, and um, the balance between both uh, doing uh, transient art and permanent art at the same time within the same yeah. style parallels his, his sense of responsibility to both give it away while also charging for it within different contexts, within different platforms. I mean, you know, we'll, we'll get into the, the sort of uh, relationship to graffiti and these kind of things in terms of public space, in terms of, um, you know, uh, John touched on it, in terms of uh, engaging the public became a really primary act that, the, you know, Keith, obviously uh, found a home on these black panels initially, but as, as that era and the black panels disappeared, um, Keith really you know, was consistent in terms of just finding a bigger public platform for it, whether it was the Lower East Side murals or Crack is Whack. Um, you know, again, uh, I think what was what was most consistent and maybe attractive to Keith about graffiti in essence was um, the lack of filter, the lack of uh, sort of uh, um, mechanism. Yeah, or, direct. You know, that, that yes, he came from art school. Yes, he understood the parameters of the gallery world. But he also immediately engaged the context and, and a street level experience that eliminated that. Um, eliminated the filter, eliminated the uh, sort of uh, conservative mechanism of how you were supposed to display art. Yeah. Well, Eric, Eric, while you have the mic, um, I was blown away by a certain phrase in your blog. I'm going to repeat it and just beg you to comment as long as it takes another hour. Go for it. And that, that, st that statement is there is no substitute for speed and competence of total commitment to the moment. That sums up Herring, that sums up any artist, but you want to expand on that? Well, I think, you know, uh, 
I'm going to try and avoid using graffiti as a catchphrase, but that's that's at the essence of um, our understanding of graffiti from the beginning was that it was uh, it was about the moment, it was about the act. It could get cleaned off, it could get gone over, um, and you know, even in the earliest stage, it wasn't intended for a larger audience. It was uh, almost a sport that you played that was about the moment. It was about the act of creation. And if you shared it with, uh, you know, a, a small immediate audience, that was great. But it wasn't, uh, it was understood in its impermanence. And I think the, the, that moment, um, and I think even uh, the speed with which one had to work in spray paint informed that, that, that there was no going back. And, and I think, uh, I wouldn't say that, um, I, I would say that Keith would have done what he did in the way he did without that information, but I think it was sort of a perfect marriage of the time. What I notice is he always makes a boundary, and then he builds that boundary, but then he makes a sub sub boundary and builds that sub, and then a, a sub sub, and suddenly you cover the whole floor. So it's nesting and embedding, you know, the fillet, and that's just a structure for nesting other figures and information. It's like this density of information, like the the beautiful uh, matrix drawing in the show. I hope you've seen it, or if not, see it. That really long, what is it, 50 feet? I forget that, that is. Um, it, it's, it's just this incredible density of information. The figures resolve into these you know, different clusters of spaces, and every aspect is, is, is filled in with this kind of energy and vibration. It's really incredible. And he did that, he executed that with no prior plans. Right? Yeah, time for a little artistic biography. You were lucky to know him when he was a bus boy in the Desenteria. You want to talk about early Keith as you knew him? Um, wow. Yeah, where, where do I start? Um, you know, I think it's important to understand, especially the time period in this show, that. Uh, you know, we understand Keith as a very successful, very influential artist, but you also have to understand that, uh, you know, prior to the internet and prior to the kind of communications we're privy to now, it was really uh, sort of much more inner city, and that Keith, you know, was working as a busboy at the club Danceteria when he had his white column show that, um, you know, not only did he have the same commitment to what he was doing and the same sort of understanding of his tools and, and motivation, um, you know, I think uh, I like to say that we lived in an era where there was no blueprint yet. There was no aerial map of how you created um, this kind of iconic identity. I mean, obviously, there were the Warhols and there were people that uh, Keith took his cues from in terms of uh, understanding the nature of being a public figure. You know, I also want to say, um, you know, uh, artistically as well as personally, Keith was by far the most generous person I've ever known in, in spirit and in action. Oh, yeah. um, you know, and I think, uh, again, in relation to, say, the graffiti community, we were a sort of tight-knit group that um, was sort of defensive in our posture. I mean, we didn't want to be understood. We didn't want to be included in, in the establishment. And, uh, you know, it was a sort of rougher era where, you know, born out of street gangs, where there was a, a perhaps unhealthy sense of competition amongst us. Um, and Keith sort of jumped into the fray yeah. Um, through uh, some meetings we used to have with a group called Soul Artists on the Upper West Side. And, you know, I think Keith really impacted us in, in his generosity of spirit, in how he extended himself. He, he invited us to be in a, in a show called Beyond Words at the Mud Club, where he was very involved. And, you know, we were sort of uh, 
Bronx, Uptown Manhattan, and Brooklyn people, and Keith was really our first introduction and window into the Lower East Side and this vibrant sort of alternative downtown uh, art scene. But, um, you know, as much as Keith may have been attracted to what had been going on in our community, he really extended himself to us to yeah. open our minds and, uh, you know, see the big picture in a way I don't think we did at that time. Well, Eric, one thing, another thing I'm dying to ask you is simple, just one word, signs. Signs? Signs. Signs in communication. In, in terms of symbolism? In, in any sense, but mostly those incredible figures, the dog, the spaceship, the radiating wand, you name it. You know, I, I can only say that Keith was blessed to sort of find his, uh, find his symbols so early on. Um, you know, the extent to which he built such a body of work around such uh, sort of simple, universal elements uh, in itself is remarkable. Um, but I think uh, that, that if you look at the work and in this show, he sort of bounces back between, you know, very symbolic and very narrative to, um, you know, abstract and much more minimalist. The, the, one of the things that strikes me about everything he did was his accessibility. And I think that the symbolism has a lot to that, has a lot to do with that in terms of, of its absolute universality. Um, you know, some of my favorite work was always uh, the stuff that really bordered on abstraction. The, the iconography's there, the symbolism's there, but if you look at sort of some of the circular mandala pieces and, and you know, the, the pieces that um, could be Navajo in that context, they could be primitive in that context, yet they're so truly modern within their time. Um, that that's the the, uh, the amazing power of the, of the very uh, simplistic approach to symbolism, and, and, and simplistic is uh, probably the wrong word because it, it, uh, it, it, there was much more deeper thought and intention, I believe, to the simplistic elements than uh, one might imagine. Well, there's something I wanted to ask. Uh, John and Martin at the same time. Uh, Keith once said, primordial styles keep you new. And when you think immediately of ancient pyramids being irradiated by far out spaceships, which is the most dramatic example. Of primordial? <laughs> like cave paintings. Yeah. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, no, I do. <laughs> I just thought of cave paintings. <laughs> the lines in cave paintings are very linear. Like, like yeah. petroglyphs, you know, yeah, like, petroglyphs, you know, it's like yeah. you know, like all of his, you know, glyphic pieces. They they, they kind of resonate with with forms that, that that go way back, but yet they're so contemporary. You know, at the same time. You know, and and I think that simplicity allowed his work to be translated in so many forms. Uh, we're looking at uh, 3D sculpture, and you yeah, know, like if, if you wander through the pop shop, um, you know, again, there's a simplicity that is sort of never lost in translation wherever he chooses to take it to. Um, I, I never felt, you know, to Keith's credit that these figures repeat a lot. He'll get oh, yeah. he'll get an icon of an arrangement of maybe two or three figures, and I'll see it repeated. Like yeah. I just showed you in the book, that's the exact oh, yeah. same oh, two yeah. figures that I oh, have sure, in this yeah. book here. Yeah. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's funny that he would lift his own yeah. template yeah. that he could reuse in so many different guises, right? And that would help him multiply the material. You know what I mean? If he was pulling uh, you know, like a, a bag of tricks, let's say, you know. Um, Keith, Keith meant it when he said that, because he put it in his body. Yes. Went, this, I'm happy in Afro-American culture. Yes. Or I'm not so happy with him, whatever. Mm -hmm. He had a control of 
of street gesture, meaning black gesture, but better than any artist I know, really. But anyway, um, one last thing, um, Eric. Um, you want to? Well, this is for all the panel. You guys discuss how Keith was able to melt the boundary between art and commerce. Um, you know, I think this is. Uh perhaps one of the most underrated areas of Keith's contribution. Um, besides the fact that early on Keith was interested in splitting the difference between high and low and may have taken some heat for it from the people on the high end whose, uh, whose pockets were at stake when he gave it away on the other side of the fence. But again, just sort of pulling the lens back, my my memory and understanding of, of those times was that the fine art world, gallery world, and the world of graphic design and product were so much farther apart than they are these days. That, that uh, design and, and the art of reproductions were almost sort of considered this bastard child of the art world, and, and it was commercial. It was sort of a dirty word. But Keith understood the, the potential, uh, again, in terms of accessibility. And you know, we go back to the idea of permanence. I think Keith also understood that um, to recreate this imagery, this iconography, intangible product mm. allowed not only greater access, but, but greater ownership. On a, on a level that um, didn't demand deep pockets, and that um, in terms of uh, that exchange of ownership, um, it extended the permanence of the work, um, and that you know uh, that I feel you know, and the pop shop was a great risk for him um, on some levels, and you know he pushed through because it was really, really important to him to make sure that this work was, was accessible economically, not just accessible intellectually. And I think- But he was uh, a celebrity. But this was, you know- and Part the, of the, the idea of a celebrity is to have his people, like a, a pop singer has their fans, right? So Keith Haring had his fans out there that needed to that he needed to address and to constantly pay attention to. I think that was a very important part of what, who he was as an artist, was to, is to maintain a relationship with his thousands of Keith Haring fans out there that needed to get the pins and the, and the posters and all that kind of stuff. It was a very important part of who he was, you know. But I, but I think it's, it, it becomes a little camouflaged if you, if you put it in the guise of celebrity and, and his um, fame. Being camouflaged. Well, you know, when, when you introduce being famous and you introduce celebrity, you, you, you sort of think it, it, it raises the bar in terms of, of the scope of what you're talking about when, in fact, it was um, the denizens of the Lower East Side. Those were the people he wanted to have pins and, and toys and pillows that... Uh, that I think that, was international. And kids, too. But, but I'm, what I'm saying is that the, the famous people, the celebrities, the, the, the people who enjoyed success could afford his art. That's they, not, no, I mean it the other way around. I mean, if you're Judy Garland, you have your fans, right? right? I don't mean that he's appealing to the Judy Garland. He's doing the same as celebrities do, which is they all have their fan base, which they have to maintain and take care of. And that was an important part of what he was doing. Uh, absolutely. And I think what we're, what we're, what, one sec, what we're pointing out is that, that there were, say, two fan bases simultaneously that were at complete opposite ends of the spectrum. You know, Tony Schifrazi in the art world had to satisfy the demands and, and value system of his fan base, if you will, uh, clientele in the art world, while at the same time there was a whole different um, demographic of his fan base audience and, say, um, consumer base 
that is just radically different than um, the gallery world and the context. But to be a legend gives collectors a, an interest in collecting a work of art. Agreed. Of a, of a, of a personality. You know, when I mean they want a name becomes precious to people. If his major works were selling for a lot of money, then um, there was the potential that doing $5 product and $10 product had a negative impact on the value system um, on the high end, and that was a calculated personal risk Keith was willing to take in every he step was, of the way. He was way. criticized for that, but he insisted on doing the populist line to go directly to the people who weren't art collectors. And he could satisfy the scarcity, the art, art always works on the principle of scarcity. You need, you know, very limited supply. So we can I do disagree his, you know, totally. And I, you know, I, in terms of the way I am totally in your person value about value. all matters having to do with business. <laughs> but I will say that in my opinion, scarcity is not the issue. And I, you know, look at Picasso, right? Or Warhol. Um, I, I think that the problem with Keith Haring was not scarcity, and I'm I'm making this up as I go along, okay? So trust me, I mean, don't trust me, is what I mean to say. <laughs> uh, we'll in my humble on. opinion, I think that the point of collectors is they may be looking for some artifact of Keith Haring's that has some intrinsic realness to them, yeah. as opposed to a blueprint, as opposed to a Xerox or a, a copy of something, right? So Warhol was very care careful to have some of his paintings were done in a kind of uh, original feel to them, right? And that's the trick with Keith Haring. I mentioned earlier that yeah. some of the drips seem very crucial to the value of the work, right? So of course a collector is not going to want something that is the same as everybody else has. But I think what they were looking for maybe is, uh, you know, this pressure on the artist to continually invent themselves and to produce something that is that they had never seen before, right? So, but, but I don't think the reproduction is what was the problem, in my opinion. I, I, don't, I don't think there was a problem. Somebody has a yes. question? Yeah. Oh, uh, yes, please, seize the day. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna join in on that. Yes. Because um, I sort of disagree with you, and I think that um, one of the things that you haven't mentioned and what you've forgotten is that um, in the beginning, he was all about reaching out to the people, and when he was doing those um, top subway drawings, he, instead of telling people when they would come up to him and ask them, or ask him, like, you know, who are you, what are you doing this for, blah, 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 he had made buttons with his right. work on them and handed them to the people so that they could be part of it and have something, they, they could hand, like, take it with them and appreciate it. And, I think that by saying that he opened this pop shop for because celebrity and trying did to... Did I say celebrity? Yes, no, yes. I said celebrity. I did not say that... You I'm, said celebrity. You just I'm, said celebrity. I'm, 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 I am just, so misunderstood. Just, <laughs> did, do, do me a favor, please no. just clarify what it is you, you're disagreeing with because yes. I think we've, we've oh, kind of covered that. Yes, it's confusing. Yeah, no, because I think that, no, I'm, with the whole idea that he opened it as sort of this, um, you know, because like you're talking about like for the You may misunder, you may be thinking that I'm saying to you that he lacked all generosity or feelings of, of kindness towards the people that he was giving things away to. And I never meant that, so please. No, I didn't say that. Well, you well, that, I'm sorry, that's not, that wasn't my implication. I was just saying that um, I think that part, part of the motivation behind opening the pop shop was um, perhaps a continuation of that generosity of handing out buttons to say who he was or t-shirts and also I think somebody, one of um, either Eric or, um, I'm sorry, Robert, Martin, sorry, um, had mentioned um, the, um, the um, sorry, I lost my all right, just, just, just. But I want to say I, I am completely with you, and I'm your side. I'm on your side. And, and, and just forget just, that guy over here. That's just, awesome. just to clarify, um, Keith was doing product, was giving it away, was selling it long before the pop shop. The pop shop was just a natural evolution of him really. Uh, 
raising his hand and saying, I'm doing this and I'm going to do it on a bigger level, regardless of any consequences. Jane, Jane. Um, I just want to throw in a point of what I feel is important of uh, Keith's way of news since 1980. This is Jane Nixon speaking right here. I'm not yes. yeah, Keith's yes. American question. Um, Keith was about joy, I think this is what, and generosity. And, you know, from when he was handing out little baby buttons when there was a women's um, reproductive rights march on down Fifth Avenue in 1981, this is before he had any, you know, the pop shop or anything like that. To, I mean, I remember working with him, we were both doing books and we were stapling them in his loft, and he was like, I'm just having so much fun, I can't stop drawing. You know, and when you talk about all these repeating things, it's because he drew all day, that's why he developed his style so fast. And he never met an offer that he didn't find exciting. So when I said, hey, he, I can do this artist series on the billboard in one time square, you want to do it? He was like, great. And I think, I, I feel like it wasn't so much strategic, like how can I, you know, feed my fans? It was that, and, and I was just actually talking to Frank Kazooie who helped him develop the pop shop, and she was like, he just would say, this is so much fun, I'm so excited, and you know, and people were attracted to his energy, and I feel like that's what people love about his energy around the world. You know, my kids that didn't know him, but he gave, you know, when they were born, he gave them little Keith Young t-shirts. <laughs> you know, they, they, they put his work up in college because it's generous. And he was really, really generous, and whoever approached him, he'd be like, great, let's be, you know, let's do giant sculptures, let's do a chapel, let's do neon lights, sure, let's do t-shirts. He was an expansive spirit, and, and, and that more than all this art world strategy and, stuff, I and, think, mm -hmm. is what he was and, and I think, in terms of what you're saying, Keith was unfiltered as an individual, and that's, uh, that's true of his work, and that's true of the generosity, and that's true of, you know, what you were saying with engaging in people. Keith was just very, in a very open soul. Um, the work, bless him, came out of him very open and in an unfiltered fashion, but that was who he was. It wasn't just uh, a question of his artistic mission. Yeah, but I have a simple question to ask, and that is, can you just position King culturally? <laughs> position King culturally, wow. Our, our resident academic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I'm not going to play the buzzkill academic here. Um, uh, you know, there's a, the, the great thing about, about Keith, and, and like a lot of pop artists too, is there's the ability to do, to make some really serious statements about art, but without losing the fun, you know, without losing the joy, without losing the motivation for it. And there's definitely a serious side to Keith. I mean, especially those, those early years. I'm just gonna bring up a couple of images, you know, to look at. Um, uh, for the fun of it, to give us some, you know, some reference points. Um, um, it, one of the things I was thinking about, you know, preparing for this talk and for, for a book that I'm working on is thinking about this, you know, what I call a whole dialogic context going on in New York in, in 78 when he arrives. You know, I think uh, John referred to it and Eric both. It's, it was like the the art world was kind of up for grabs, you know. You had a lot of these competing forces, you know, you're going to art school, you're getting a lot of input and information. Uh, one of the great things that happened in the 70s, you know, the legacy of, of pop and concept, <clears throat> conceptual and performance was uh, what I call finally uh, killing the uh, teleological steamroller of art history. That is that, uh, the job of the artist is to somehow fulfill the direction of art history, whatever that is, you know. Um, and that really wasn't what Keith was about, what his generation was about. I think a lot of what the 70s artists were about is the sense that, well, okay, this whole grand narrative of art history is, is uh, 
it's, it's over, it's at its end. Uh, and now there's a sense of, all right, what's next? What are we gonna do? And the whole thing was, was opened up to a different sense of what the role of the artist could be, especially post-Warhol in the sense of how you manage high and low and all of these different resources. And Keith got so much stuff intuitively from just you know, a number of really interesting hints. I just want to take you through, like, trip down memory lane, you know. Um, all right, he's really interested in pictographs and symbols and how he could develop. You know, we've been talking about how very quickly he got, how he could do this recognizable array of symbols that, that people got right away. Well, you come to New York in the 70s, there's still the legacy of Abex, there's still the legacy of all these sage and serious artists, including Gottlieb. I don't think he ever references or, or refers to Gottlieb specifically, but when you think about all the stuff that's going on, that's kind of presupposed and assumed and is part of the mix, uh, there's no way that him making the work or the way it's received, especially in the art world, right, uh, cannot kind of set up these coordinates and say, okay, where is he positioned? What is he thinking about, right? So. The Abex people were, were experimenting with glyphs and signs and symbols and pictograms because they were baking up the picture plane. And again, this was back when breaking up the picture plane was part of what the fuck do we do with this grand narrative of our history, right? And we're gonna fuck up painting because we doesn't, it doesn't need to be illusionistic anymore. We can do whatever we want on the surface. But there's still the problem of we're painters and we got the picture plane, right? That's, that was the dilemma back then. And now superficially, you could say, oh well, here's some glyphs and you know, images and, and, and pictograms that look superficially like what Keith might have come up with or Basquiat might have come up with, but it's superficial because we know that what's going on here is part of a completely different art argument, right? A completely different art story, but if you're in New York in the 70s, it's part of the story. It's part of what you got to deal with. I got to tell you a really cool side story about Francis Ryan McGinnis. You know, there are other artists who's kind of inspired by this whole thing. Went to a, a studio one day and spray painted on his wall was, "Art history is the competition." <laughs> and what I found so cool about that, it wasn't in kind of like nice printed poster, but in spray paint, "Art history is the competition." Right? Well, it's only one of the competitions. Uh, I had to throw this in because in 95, the Brooklyn Museum did a Gottlieb exhibition. So we're kind of in that history. So we got the whole pictograph idea going way back. Now, Keith said when, you know, when he was in Pittsburgh, he was totally inspired by Pierre Olszewski. What I found in interesting, too, about Keith is that he drew from these outliers, these kind of oddball characters who weren't part of the main story of the avant-garde, they weren't part of the main story of Abex. They weren't really part of any story. I mean, the, the Cobra group of artists that Elishinsky was with, a, you know, a different kind of traditional story. But he got what Elishinsky was doing. Elishinsky was working in Sumi ink, right, doing these big, huge, expansive things. And, as he, and you could see, he would block out these frames and put all these images. Again, non-narrative, imagistic, symbolic, and ways of building up this kind of uh, expressionist imagery. Uh, it's something that, that Keith got right away and, and ran with it. Uh, here's some other images. Well, look at snakes, like all this stuff, all this kind of imagery. And you can see Keith think, well, like, yeah, I can, I can work with that. You know, the snake is one of those iconic things. Uh, but again, he would synthesize and rechannel it and rethink about how he was going to do it. Well, I had to throw this in, what goes around comes around. There's a, there's a big, huge uh, Elishinsky mural in Paris right now. And when I looked at it, I was thinking, well, you know, probably without the disciple doing something, without Keith Haring actually showing what street art could do, uh, I seriously doubt if this installation would have happened. So we've got Elishinsky now scaled up huge, you know, in Paris. Uh, the kind of thing that, of course, you know, uh, Keith would have done too. Just some other things. He says he really admired Mark Toby, like another one of those outliers in the kind of abex thing, uh, working with symbols and all over compositions and all this stuff. You can tell that he was seriously looking at this. You know, when you see, you know, when you see some of Keith's early kind of gestural calligraphic things, you know. He was looking at this work and he was thinking about 
how do I draw from this and make it live? How do I make it mine, right? Well, how can you be in New York in the 70s and 80s and not know about Cy Twombly, right? Um, the graphic, gestural stuff. And what I find fascinating about this and thinking about it as part of this dialogic world that the artists are working through is that, again, this is back in this old art historical problem of the picture plane. And what Twombly is doing, he's quoting writing and graffiti and gestures, right? He's not using it as an instrument, right? He's, he's, he's quoting it to do something with the picture plane. He's not using writing or graffiti to make stuff. And that's very different. What's up, what else is interesting in this kind of dialogic universe is at just the moment when, when Basquiat is working on the street and, and Herring is trying to figure out what he's doing, in the high art world, you know, with, with Twombly continuing on this kind of later day interpretation of Abex, Twombly's going classical, right? Series of paintings on Homer's Iliad, you know, that, that are drawing and gestural, right? So there's a, to me, that this is good kind of a desperate act, you know, to bring seriousness and history and gravity into this, into this tradition. When, on the other hand, you've got, you've got guys in the street, you've got graffiti artists uh, who are going right at it directly, you know, not, not this kind of faux naive, you know, writing and gestural stuff. 78, a series of paintings on Homer's Iliad. I mean, what, all this other stuff bursting around on the street, you know, it, it, it's really, really striking. So, you're growing up in New York and you're seeing all this stuff around. Of course, you've got, you know, John Michel Basquiat working. Maybe you guys know this image. It's a uh, famous, you know, cover art uh, for the Ronald Z uh, single that, that was used in uh, Style Wars. And so we got, you know, he befriends Basquiat. He's aware of what's going on on the street, you know. Uh, and he's aware of all the amazing subway graffiti, which I'm going to get to in a minute. So again, mixing high and low, another artist that he, that he was really inspired by, which is very different, uh, A.R. Pank, a German expressionist. Again, another one of these kind of oddball outliers who was never really championed as one of the you know, high artists of, of, the, uh, of the modern world in Germany. But he's there, and he's a player. He's interesting. Uh, uh, Keith was in the same art fair, I think it was the Cologne art fair, I forget which year that was, where there was some pink uh, paintings and drawings, uh, one of the dealer's uh, spaces, uh, at the same time uh, somebody was showing his work, and uh, Herring said, I love going there and seeing his work, but I blew him away, you know? <laughs> didn't, didn't Pink show with Shafrazi? Well, was, I, was I it? think there was a pink show at Shafrazi. That would have made sense, too. it would have made sense. Uh, but you can see what's going on here. You've got these kind of primitive figures and imagery, you know, that, that you could see that Keith was saying. You've got the snake, right? Uh, say, oh, okay, I get it, yeah. That's, that's going somewhere, I can work with that. Uh, and then you get stuff that's a lot more, you know, primitive and gestural, you know, okay. And then Pink starts getting more abstract. Uh, color ground, but still using this kind of solid black line, right, in 82 and 83. Of course, by that time, Keith was already, he was already gone. You know, he was already out on his own. Uh, again, the, the other context, you know, you've got Cy Twombly doing this, like, you know, high-level classical thing going on. Uh, at the same time, you've got, you know, all the, all the great uh, graffiti stuff going on in New York. So by 83, you've got the, you know, the famous Sidney Janis show. Uh, in 84, the, the uh, was the Crash show, right? Uh, um, and these other, look at just these dates, you know, the famous, you know, Chalfant book, you know, in, in 81, uh, Charlie Ahern's movie in 83, uh, Tony Silver's movie, Star Wars in 83, and the famous Subway art book, uh, which again, kind of locks into cultural memory all the stuff that was going on from the, from the mid-70s to this time. Worth noting, of all of those, the New York New Wave show at PS1 oh, in yeah, 1981 exactly. was, yeah. was a, Seminal New York show on a lot of levels, but um, for my generation, for the graffiti artists, it was the first time we cross-pollinated and were exposed to uh, the likes of hanging our work together with Warhol, with Keith, with Jean, with Maplethorpe. I think. Uh, 
you know, it's a whole conversation in itself, but yeah, there, there were a few real formative moments where, where everybody ended up under the same banner for the first time in... in yeah, that was a, a, a real uh, transitional moment, really, really important moment. We were talking, you know, earlier about the subway work. You know, Keith, you know, the journalist said he came to New York and one of the most exciting things he saw was, was the life and the energy of the graffiti on the subway cars. He immediately gravitated to this. Uh, the energy, the beauty, uh, it, it was really transformative. And, and Lee, you know, Mione's uh, friend, they showed together, uh, Crash, of course. I, I just kind of threw these together as quickly as I could just to say, okay, this is a visual context. We were talking about, you know, okay, here's this creative synthesis. Well, he said he watched videos of, of Pierre Alashinsky working large on the, on the floor, creating these big, you know, canvases. And here he is, he's filling out the frame, drawing it in, figuring out his own abstract vocabulary. This is one of the early drawings where, yeah, he's working on these signs and symbols, he's abstracting all kinds of stuff out. And then by the time he's working on the, 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 the subway panels, uh, what I love about this is that, you know, he was doing so many of them, he was treating them really as his, his, his laboratory, his studio. You know, he, he would go and just do it uh, 40, 40 at, a, at a time in one day. Um, and it was a way to improvise, it was a way to really work this out performatively. Uh, and he worked out so much of his vocabulary that way. Uh, really brilliant move. I can go on and on about the significance of working on blank advertising panels, but Keith got it intuitively. He knew this was a this was a messaging system that he could hack, that he could work with, and he could redirect in terms of making really interesting acts of art, right, in a way that hadn't been done before. And in the Times Square st <clears throat> storyboard, you get you know the, the kind of sequence of a lot of his, his classic imagery, you know, that he works with. You know, the barking dog, the baby, the TV set. I always love these kind of menacing crosses, you know, that, that are in the background all the time. Um, you know, the dog with, with the cross and the snake and, and you know, barking a nuclear, you know, an atom. I mean, the whole thing is just amazing, you know? Uh, it's like this spontaneous combustion of, of imagery. Um, and you can see that, well, he, he was synthesizing all this, you know, a lot of the stuff and more, obviously, from some of the imagery I showed you earlier. But he was a great, great improviser. You know, again, the panels, you know, filled in all this imagery. And what's so cool about it is he got this kind of storyboarding, paneling idea, but it wasn't narrative like comics. And it wasn't that, you know, that each panel was part of some sort of story or, or added up to a narrative. But it formed its own kind of iconic space. Yeah, and he really saw the, the power of working that way. And of course, now, you know, the great drawing here and in others where he could just scale up and use all this space for this real complexity and density of information. And, uh, you know, he, like Warhol, was frequently criticized for just being too pop, too simplistic, too whatever. I want to end with two famous paintings that to me have always been some of his most powerful. It's a little beyond the context, but it shows that, well, yeah, you, you want complexity, you want something that's going to blow you away, you want something that isn't just radiating babies. Well, here you are, motherfuckers, basically. Uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, these two, these two paintings, uh, the, Luckily, the, the top one is at the Hirshhorn Museum in Washington, D.C., which, you know, where I live. Every time I see that, whenever they have it out, I'm just totally blown away. And, of course, the, the Michael Stewart uh, uh, kind of commemorative piece uh, at the bottom is, is just, it, it's, it's so powerful. You've got the symbolism, you've got surrealism, you've got the grotesque, you've got the, the kind of line drawing gestures that he's famous for. But then he just pushes it. I mean, he just pushes it in a whole new uh, in a whole new direction. So, you know, he can do this, but there were moments when he was so moved to do that dense, complex piece that was like from the inner core of his being that he just, he just had to get this out. He could do this too. You know what I mean? The range of what he could do is just spectacular. So I know that's really quick and brief, but the, I'm always, I'm always uh, astonished and impressed by how he synthesized from 
very, so many different sources, uh, his, his own language, and did it in what, two years, two or three years? A question here? But I also want to say, hip hop is urban culture. It did not have a color to it. And those dancers were Puerto Rocks, Puerto Ricans, um, and everyone contributed, and I think that's why he very felt it so easy to come into this world and be a part of it. It wasn't until the commercialization of graffiti and hip hop did it, and, and specifically the music industry, did they segregate it and say, this is black. And I found that as a person from New York, very insulting. It wasn't just black, it was urban, it was born out of poverty, boredom, and like you said, being, culture being ignored, and it created a whole new culture. Well, my question means that I always wanted to know, no one's ever asked answer this, and maybe there was a woman in the back of the friend. When did, not the commercial world, but the political world come to peak? Did, did, did they come, like for instance, he did a lot of the drawing for the AIDS walkathons, and it became a huge symbol of what AIDS stood for. If you saw Keith Haring, you were like, oh, he's about AIDS. Um, or, or the crack, the crack piece, whack, stuff like that. So I always wondered, did, was he political and the politics came to him? Or did politics come to him because they saw, like the woman said, everybody, I remember when I got Keith Henry, well, I didn't know Keith Henry, I never met the man, but I was like, yo, I know Keith Henry. <laughs> <laughs> I think it is a bit of the chicken and the egg. I think Keith was always a political animal on some level. Um, and I think as his star began to rise and both he and the world around him understood sort of the power that he wielded, um, Keith uh, assumed the role of um, promoting change and promoting uh, whatever he felt um, comfortable with politically. I mean, you know, as a, as a, as a punctuation to that, um, in the later stages, when Keith was diagnosed HIV positive, um, he actually sat down myself and probably a number of his good friends and, and basically said, I want to tell you this, you know, uh, People had been passing around him, his boyfriend as well, and you know he had prepared himself for that moment politically and personally. And it wasn't only that he wanted to tell us himself before it was public, but part of his message was, I'm going to be open and as proactive about this, and I understand that um, I'm in a unique position to um, use whatever time I have in the most positive fashion politically in terms of AIDS awareness and in terms of um, not, uh, not hiding behind anything about it, to, to be very open and very proactive and very um, consciously political about getting ahead of the movement, getting ahead of the medicine, getting ahead of people's perception about um, the medical realities, but um, I think that is the ultimate example of Keith embracing um, what was obviously, uh, you know, uh, a, a negative and a crisis for him personally, and finding a way to turn it into something um, uh, as positive symbolically, politically, and personally as he could. And, and I think those things always went hand in hand with Keith as his, as his uh, reach grew, so did his sense of uh, social and political responsibility. I think it's really great in the show you can really look back and see how his personality was very much attacked even as an adolescent in the sketchbooks, because you know, the inside of the sketchbook stand. And you can see him doing walkathons and having this social conscience from a very young age. So while, well, yeah, it did proceed from uh, a disconnected thing, but I do think a lot of it came from him really naturally, like crack his rock or something he just wanted to do, 
he did it, and then the city parks kind of took it under their shelter once they realized this was a great public service message. And he was almost always doing public service messages very naturally uh, in a way that I don't think he connected it with like a commercialization or, you know, something that was not art. It was part of it, you know? And I, I think it was just an automatic reaction to um, the, the uh, devastation he saw around him in the neighborhood with people he worked with, with people he loved and respected, as well as strangers. That uh, I can't remember what year exactly crack is whack, but you know, again, it was it was an epidemic that Keith had, um, you know, whatever grand or whatever limited opportunity to make a statement and. and you know, he always uh, welcomed those platforms as well. When you look at women and guys like a little bit of herring and black pants, all right. First of all, let me give you a, a primer. When you look at his paintings, watch for this. I That means I am so happy. But watch for this. Say what? Would you stand like that in front of your grandmother? No. Yeah. <laughs> Culturally correct answer. Thank you. This. Yamba. Old Congo gesture means I'm tired. Let's stop. And there's a lot of it in his work. And he saw it via Capoeira, where in Capoeira it means I'm tired out. Time means this. Time out. So look for this. This but also this. Um, Keith was, Keith's best friends were B-boys, DJs. They were Latino, they were put the Kenya. He was very tight with the culture. And you can see the compliment that's being played with Keith's robot, which is like a Shiva from some sort of tantric cantina with several arms, but look at the arms that are forward. They're playing the same dum dum pa dum 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 pa across three records, so that when one is finished, boom, you start it again and it exactly the other. This was one of the discoveries of Africa Bambada and others. We had the DJ robot right at the corner of Avenue D um, and um, Houston. And Keith once drew to decode uh, dad's gestures in his, you can see the headstand, the spider move, the DJ robot, and the electric boogie. Next slide. He picked up, as soon as it happened, as soon as head spin came in with be boring, he was there. And you can see it's as if they're learning it from television. But what Keith said once, is, I put it in the subway because I knew the subway was where the b-boys were and they would recognize themselves. So these are love letters, all of them, to the black and Puerto Rican New York. Next slide, please. And it became more athletic and more uh, dangerous in the 1900s, where you can do the spin on your palm. And you can see the best b-boy in Rome, Hanavo, doing it on the left. And one of the masters of Capoeira in New York, uh, who is doing it only, they call it parafuso, which means to screw your palm into the earth. And then there's some um, music with powerful combination of commerce and art, where Keith has a, a young green boy doing the 1990 on top of a, a never, never fucking strike box. Next slide, please. And then, of course, this wonderful step called the spider moon. One of the great photographers of hip hop caught it in Queens up there in 1982-83. And you can see that, that uh, the Brazilian Capoeira star is using this move over the prostrate body of Canavo. The, the, the body is called the bridge for obvious reasons. And it leads to one of his masterpieces where the, a dancer dances over the bridge of the body of his partner. This is from his Los Angeles period, which is qualitatively one of the most exciting moments in American art, as far as I'm concerned. Next slide, please. And you can see that what he does is he turns street sign into museum sign, is to hit it with some elegance, hit it with full color, and blow it up. And now the, the ultimate has happened. 
the fusion of the two b-boys is total. They're one unit. They, are, they have come together forever. Next slide, please. But one of the things that's most beautiful about the hip-hop choreography is the electric boogie. In Black Church, when you get happy, this is a modified, modified imitation, but the Bakongo believe that the shoulders are where the spirit hits first. And the word for shoulders is mabengbo, and that puns on mayembo, which means ecstasy. And this is when you're getting really happy. And that ecstatic church behavior was seen in none other than Fresno, California, by the Solomon Brothers, who picked it up and added more electricity to it, so that Thank you. I love this class. If you want to see what it comes from, here's a shaman up in the upper right hand corner who is drawing what it feels like. The power comes down from God. It's like lightning. Your legs turn to lightning. Everything turns to lightning. But ultimately, if the power is strong enough, you're blown away. There's a leg, two legs, two arms, and God knows what else. Keith always did these things with a sense of humor. And he was saying some of these b-boys are so electric boogie that they can light a light bulb with the current in their body. Next slide. And then, of course, Egypt. Malcolm Garvey, black nationalism. It's very deep. Malcolm Garvey who said that Egypt is where we come from. Upper Egypt, the ancient black civilization. King David was into it. Those of you who know your Davidic or your Torah, Psalm 69. And princes shall come from Africa, from Egypt. And Ethiopia shall hold up her hands to the Lord. That's Davidic. That's King David's poetry. And it goes straight into not only hip hop, but it goes into reggae and a lot of uh, Afro-Jamaican. But you can see the, the vestiges of African gestures from ancient Egypt. The, the, first of all, the torso forward, the head to the side. And the, these were known as tut teams, where the hieroglyphs were played out in slightly different ways. Full palm, bent palm, angular Egypt palm, these are not just anyone, these are some of the biggest stars of the New York City Breakers on the left. But then when you look at Heath in high art context, you can see that he's loyal to it. It keeps going. Here is the tuck team over the barking dog. By the way, when I asked Keith once, what was the name of your dog? I mean, the one we had in Touchdown? Yeah, Mambo. <laughs> think, about, think about that. There's a tuck, two tuck teams battling it out. As we learned from Joe Heron and everybody else on the panel, if there's anything that's the engine of hip hop, it's a competition. And they're battling it out. Next slide, please. And then, of course, the, the wonderful transference of the spiritual electricity, transferred by a Dominican, Benito Benitez, and his black buddy. The, the energy goes through one arm, through his shoulder blade, down his arm, and into the other guy. And you see the two guys of the New York City breakers are keeping that dance alive in the 21st century. And then Keith, again, with his sense of humor, the electricity goes, boom, it hits the person, and the person goes, oh! <laughs> All right, next slide, please. And finally, we end with voguing. I mean, Keith was into that, too. Voguing is done from the, from the waist up. Voguing is done with a lot of uh, facial framing, and he caught that. And here's a voguer friend of his demonstrating one of the gestures that, that goes into voguing on the left. So, to sum up, dance is transcendent. What we are dealing with here is a man who knew that dance is more than dance. Dance is freedom. Dance is transcendence. Look at how he says it. If you dance with your partner tight enough, lovingly enough, intimately enough, you will become a pair of scissors and you can cut the bonds of other people so they share your freedom. Thanks a lot.
because you prevented me from saying what Dizzy Gillespie once had to say. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank you for coming. I'd like to thank both of you. <laughs> <laughs> very good crowd. Thank you very much.